This is a video on attribute sampling. The goal of the video is to show you how attribute sampling results are evaluated. But to do this, we first have to talk about what is attribute sampling. Attribute sampling is the sampling associated with tested controls. When we're doing tested controls, we're taking a sample of items and we're determining whether or not there are any deviations or exceptions occurring with what we are actually testing. So for example, we might look at canceled checks. Any check that has uh, an amount greater than $10,000 requires dual signatures. So two people must sign off on large checks. So that would be an example where we're looking at, say, 10 checks. We found one check that only has one signature. That one check would be considered a deviation. One thing we want to notice about attribute sampling, as well as all samples, is that auditors want to be efficient. So we can actually look at one item and test multiple attributes at the same time. So for example, with the check, we've already just mentioned that we can be looking at checks that have a large dollar amount to make sure that there are du duplicate signatures. We also might want to check to determine that every signature is an authorized um, signature. So in other words, does a person who has signed a check actually have the authority to sign that check? And then at the same time, we also might look at the payee on that check. So for example, there might be an approved list of vendors and we can determine whether or not that check was written to, an, to a vendor that was on the approved list. We're going to be taking a look with attribute sampling and the example we're going to use is whether or not credit checks were made on sales orders. So I just made this up and let's just assume that the population of sales orders is 10,000. So that's the big N is the population. And we take a sample of 50 orders. Little n is the sample size. We're not going to worry about calculation of sample size. This is just a given that we are taking a sample of 50 orders out of 10,000. And before we take the sample, we have to determine what is called the tolerable deviation rate, the TDR. And the tolerable deviation rate is akin to materiality. In other words, we can tolerate deviations of up to 5% before we say that the controls are not effective, that they're not functioning. So that TDR is in essence our materiality. And again, we decide that we can target up to 5% of cells don't have to have a proper credit check. That is, as long as the error rate is not over 5%, then we can conclude the controls are working effectively. So let's just assume that in our sample of 50, we found two deviations. Two deviations gives us an error rate of 4%. And that 4% from our sample results is called the point estimate. Now, do we think that the error rate is exactly 4% for all 10,000? And the answer to that is no, because we take a sample of 50 out of 10,000, so our sample may not be truly reflective of what's going on. So as a result, we have something called sampling risk. And just like I mentioned, sampling risk is the risk that our sample does not reflect the underlying population being tested. So we take a sample and we get results, but there's always going to be risk that our results are not truly reflective of the underlying population. So what we do when we take a sample is we're going to give ourselves an allowance for that sampling risk. In other words, we're going to say the estimate of error rate is 4%, but since we don't think that's exactly precise, we're going to give ourselves a cushion. We're going to say it's maybe a little bit more than 4% or a little bit less than 4%. And that is called the allowance of sampling risk, the ASR, and that is a cushion for our sample results. And this will make a little bit more sense in just a minute. In this example, Let's just assume that we have determined that the allowance of sampling risk is 2%. This could be calculated statistically, but let's just keep this simple and we're going to move forward assuming that that cushion, the allowance of sampling risk, is in fact 2%. So we have sample size of 50 out of 10,000. We found two errors and that gives us an error rate which is also called the point estimate of 4%. We can tolerate up to 5% error, and we're going to give ourselves an allowance for sampling risk of 2%. What you'll see here is a bell curve, and we're going to use this bell curve as an example on how we are going to evaluate attribute samples.
I realize that most populations do not follow a bell curve, but for this sample, or excuse me, this example, it's going to be easy if we just follow along with the bell curve. Plus, most of you have already had statistics, so this will kind of make a little bit more sense. So we come up with that 4% point estimate, and that is going to be right in the middle of the distribution. And we're going to give ourselves a cushion, 2% cushion plus or minus, and that's that allowance for sampling risk. Again, we don't think that our sample is going to be exactly a 4% error rate. It may be a little bit higher, it may be a little bit lower. So if I add 2% to the 4%, I will get an upper deviation limit. This upper deviation limit is 6%. Again, the point estimate plus the allowance of sampling risk gives me the upper deviation limit. And in auditing, we just normally assume um, a 5% tail. It could be given as 1% or it could be 10%. In this example, we're saying that this upper tail is 5%. This upper deviation limit right here is going to be an upper bound, just like we saw in statistics with confidence intervals. I can take the point estimate and subtract 2% that allows for sampling risk, and that will also give me the lower deviation limit. That lower deviation limit is also a bound, a lower bound, and we're going to assume that that lower tail is 5%. So given this, what we're going to say at this point is that the true but unknown error rate is between 2 and 6% inclusive, which means it could, be, it could include the 2%, include, could include the 6%. So with a 5% lower tail and a 5% upper tail, we get this 90% 90 90 confidence. So our confidence interval is 90% between 2 and 6% included. But if the error is actually 1%, and we're saying it's as high as maybe 6%, then we're actually erring on the side of conservatism because if the error rate is really down here and we're thinking it could be up here, if we make a mistake, we're okay. The problem is, is if we think the error rate is as high as maybe 6% and in fact it's 10% or 12%, much higher than we predict. So what we normally do is we ignore the lower tail. So in attribute sampling, we don't worry about the lower tail because again, if the true error rate is down here and I'm thinking it's up here, I'm going to err on the side of conservatism. So as a result, we're going to take a look at this without the lower tail and now we've modified our results. We've gotten rid of the lower tail, so now we're saying we're 95% confident that the true but unknown error rate is 6% or less. So we're going to go back to the example, kind of a clean sheet. Again, we have our parameters. Now we're going to take a look at the tolerable deviation rate, how much we can tolerate. And we throw that in here, and we see the tolerable deviation rate is right here at 5%. And that 5% is less than the upper bound. So in look at my decision, I have a decision rule. And it says, if the upper deviation rate or upper deviation limit is greater than the tolerable deviation rate, then we're going to reject. And so in this case, our conclusion is we're rejecting. The controls are not effective. And let's look at this. We're saying that we think that the error rate is as high as 6%, but we can only tolerate error of up to 5%. So we are, what we think the error rate could be 6% is more than we can tolerate, which means the controls are not effective. We're going to actually reject the controls. Now let's change the tolerable deviation rate. Let's just say the tolerable deviation rate has been established to be 7%, and this is done before the sample was taken. And if I look here, the tolerable deviation rate is 7%. I think, based on my sample, and including the allowance of sampling risk, I think the sample could have an error rate as high as 6%. I can tolerate up to 7% because what I can tolerate is more than what I think it is 
This is going to fall under the acceptable level. We're going to conclude that the controls are effective. So going back to the decision rule, if the upper deviation limit is less than or equal to the tolerable deviation rate, then we're going to accept. So the easy way of looking at this is I have this upper bound. If this tolerable deviation rate is inside the upper bound, inside here, then I'm going to reject. If the tolerable deviation rate is equal to or greater than the upper misstatement limit, the upper deviation limit rather, then I'm going to accept. So just to show you, now we're going to say the tolerable deviation rate is 6%, which equals that upper bound. In that case, equal to or out is okay. Inside the bound is reject. Because I'm equal to or outside, in this case equal to, I'm going to say the controls are effective. And going back to the decision rule, the upper bound is less than or equal to the tolerable deviation rate.